In, in, even in that bleak moment, able to take a principled stand. So, it's, um, tell, tell us how you came to the project, maybe for starters. Um, Adam had called me, and and because um, we'd done Exotica together, and asked me if I was interested in playing um, Sarah Pauli's dad. And in Exotica, if any of you have seen it, um, there's there's a moment where you're given to understand that there might have been an inappropriate relationship between that character and his daughter. And although that's kind of elliptical and not definitive, it was something that I felt I didn't want to sort of in, go in that territory twice, particularly with Adam. Oh. And, um, and I'd read the book also, and I felt I understood Billy more. So I, I called Adam back and I said, I, I, nah, but what about Billy? And, and he goes, Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we went up there, and um, and I'd grown a full beard, and because uh, I wanted to give Adam the option of how much to of it to chop off and stuff. So, and, and we took an afternoon and we sort of pared it away until we got that big sweeper mustache. And he goes, "Yeah, that's a, that's about right. That's about right." And that, at the time, I'd, I'd had a tooth knocked out, and I was wearing a flipper. Uh, you know, one of those deals that jams in your mouth, and um, and uh, and I, oh, I went, oh, what about what about I put up my take out my tooth? And I popped it out, and he goes, oh, I don't know, man, I don't know. I went, okay. You know? So and then we just had to decide um, early in the movie because I've got this big mustache. We thought if we didn't kind of billboard that early in the movie, people would be going, what the is he got? Is he missing it? What's what's up with that? So. So we chose in the dry when I was following the kids mm -hmm. to make make a really a, apparent toothless grin, so you weren't wondering later in the movie what that shadow was about. But that's um, you know that's how. There's something about Canadian actors having their teeth taken out. Do you know Tantu Cardinal? Do you no. Know she is she's a native no. native actor from uh, Alberta, who I worked with as a co-star in that picture where the rivers flow north. <laughs> And so uh, I auditioned her in L.A. and uh, she was in Dances with Wolves, Black Robe, Legends of the Falls, stuff like that. But anyway, so I, uh, I, I she played this sort of yeah. you know unschooled native character from northern New England named Bangor, who spoke in the third person. Mm -hmm. I referred to you know. Right. And um, she called me and said, you know, I, I how about if I uh, get, oh. get a tooth taken out? And oh, I said, uh, well, that's a sure. much bigger commitment. Well, she said, well, she said, you know, she had it, she had a, a whatever you call it, or, you know, uh, a replacement tooth, okay. and said, uh, I said, yeah, she said, that'd be great for the character. I could stick my tongue through it. I could use it to great advantage. And she, I said, okay. She said, uh, but you have to call my dentist. So I did. I called the dentist and I said, what would it cost to get tattoo no. tooth no. taken out and then put back no. in after the shoot? He said, forty-five hundred dollars. No. He's in L.A. And so um, I said, well, mm, $4,500. Yeah, you'll I, do it yourself, much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think we can do it. He said, about two, how about 250 <laughs> <laughs> We did it for 250 Anyway, it's yeah. good thing about, you know, uh, actors who, could, who are good sports at that. So you had the tooth out for the whole shoot, for the whole shoot, yeah? Yeah, I just kept it out. Yeah. Sometimes I didn't notice it, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I kept it out for the whole month. My teeth kind of went a little wonky as a result. Mm -hmm. So where was this film uh, in terms of your development of your career and you know, getting jobs and being known? Um, it was the was first prominent role. Yeah, it was the first thing I'd done that's besides Exotica that seemed to have some weight to it because I sort of made my bread and butter doing movies of the week and, you know, just sort of marginally valuable things if, if they were at all valuable and I was sort of tied to the idea of making money and and because um, I sort of equated that with being happy and being successful and and um, and then I'd done Exotica and that was well received and and uh, it was an opportunity to do something that had some weight to it and and uh, I guess it gave me a little bit of credibility in that yeah, yeah. Oh, it was great great performance I think um, can everybody here 
Bruce in the back? He's telling you lower. It's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch it now, given the tempo, right? Because, particularly when it's so hot in the row, it's really difficult. But, um, but it's, uh, you know, it was a time when you could, you could linger over shots and not, be, and not be faulted for it. I mean, I watch it now, and I think, well, you've, you've really got to invest in the, in, the, in the time in which this was made. To understand that, even even notwithstanding um, Paul Schrader's comments today about you know ling linger uh, yeah. for three seconds on a doorway, um, this is one of those really languid films that asks you to to sit there and be uncomfortable for long, long moments. <laughs> and uh, it's I, I don't know that a film like this could could survive today. You know, I think we were very lucky to have made it when we did. I think, I, I don't have a problem with the pace. I mean, did anybody really feel sort of, uh, you know, inconvenienced by the pace of the film, by, by just the way it, Well, I've seen it, you know, it was, a handful yeah. of times, too, so I'm, it, maybe that sort of contributes to my yeah. inability to, I can't see it for the first time, you know. I mean, the other thing for me is that, you know, it's a dark story for sure, but I think it's compassionate, you know, and that the mm -hmm. each of char each character's humanity, including you know mm -hmm. the lawyer, mm -hmm. is developed in ways that offer complexity that I think reveals you know important elements of what it is to be in a small community, what it is to have family, what it is to um, you know face a tragedy. I mean, I think that mm -hmm. uh, it, it uses irony well. I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. No, you can't rush despair. You know. Yeah. You can't, if you're gonna, if you're gonna let people, if you really want to let people feel it, you gotta, because that it doesn't, you know, in real life it doesn't come and go. It comes yeah. and, and lives there, and um, that's what Adam was brave enough to do. You know? mm -hmm. And it has the appropriate ending. I mean, Dolores is the one play, person that just needs to get freed from that place, mm -hmm. and she does. Mm -hmm. uh, which and she, you see her, and she's. Her old self, to a certain extent, you know, putting yeah. uh, people back on the bus, and uh, and it's hard to know. I mean, of course, the final moments are really that the town has been changed forever, and you know, you wonder that there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope that the town is necessarily going to. I mean, it's always going to have this scar. It's always going to have this loss, and that's just part of what life is there. I think in a yeah. small town, it's hard to recover from something like that. Yeah, that human nature is such that 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 um, Sarah's character decides to to look at her dad for the first time and understand what he's taken from her, and the only thing you know the the way she chooses to to get back at him compromises her forever also. So she in her in her in her need to to. To tell him the truth and to speak the truth, she lies, and then we'll ultimately we'll have to live with that lie, even though it was it exposed the truth to this, to him and no one else. Oh. Oh. You know, it's uh, it's it's, it's sort of the tragedy is it's tragedy heaped upon tragedy. Anyway. Mm -hmm. What's it like to work with Adam? Uh, he's a bullient and um, and easygoing and loves a joke, and you'd you'd never. You'd never know from Exotica or this movie that the experience of making it was was um, energetic and joyful. And Paul Sarasi, the DP, is also um, a, a, a very, very energetic guy and, and full of love and full <laughs> full of sizzle, you know. And uh, so the so the energy was always. Um, with those two is always really, really good, and there's lots of synergy. So, um, you know, in spite of the subject matter, it was um, everybody wants to go to work. You know, people are familiar with Sarah Polly's work at all. Um, uh, what's the What's the name of the uh, film she directed that was nominated for Away from Away her. from Her with Julie Christie? I don't think anybody saw that film uh, a few years ago. Julie Christie. Uh, moving into Alzheimer's, and um, really fabulous film. Uh, Another comedy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Maury Chaikin, another interesting actor. Oh, Maury's so good. Maury is the guy that played uh, Alberta Watson's husband, the overweight.
Broadway guy who ran the hotel. And yeah, he, I mean, his whole performance style is so effortless and so seamless. I just why every time I see him in anything, he's one of those guys. You just go, he's like Gandolfini that way, right? He just has that big, grounded ability to be large and still completely believable. Yeah, he was in Dances with Wolves. That's one other part right. that he did. But, um, yeah, so uh, in terms of giving direction, I mean, does yeah. he keep a conversation going? Uh, does he give a lot of uh, notes? Does he like lots of takes? I mean, just in general. No, he's pretty He's pretty loose on the reins, Adam is. Uh, we do lots of talking beforehand, but in, on the day, he's he's comfy to, to sort of take what you're giving him. He'll tweak you a little bit. and. Um, yeah, well, he got great performances all around. I mean, there's nothing, uh, there's not a false note, I don't think, in the film. It's, uh, and he, I mean, the same way that Paul Schrader was talking today, he, he likes faces, he likes to allow those faces to express fully and, mm -hmm. and even go through some transition or articulation of emotion as it develops, which is nice. And Paul Sarasi is sort of, uh, plays that game really nicely with him in terms of the way he likes people and he'll He'll light your eyes when it's necessary. He'll pull back and dim your eyes when it's when he wants to be when he wants to take a step back and remove you from the audience a little bit. It's all I think it's all very conscious on his part. Mm -hmm. I imagine it is anyway because he's, he's so specific. As I was saying earlier, his Paul Sarasi has also sort of made some kind of celestial deal with with the devil, where if you're shooting outdoors mm -hmm. and the weather is bad, it will change for him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're because you can see all the snowy shots up there, and you, but the mountains were always had a little bit of light on them, you know. And when they didn't have light, it was because he'd waited for the light to go away. <laughs> he's um, he's just a, he's a magical DP that way, and he doesn't use a lot. Of, there's not a lot of paraphernalia hanging around. He lights with very little, so it's quick. So did you shoot north of Montreal up towards Mont Tremblant? No, all the mountain stuff was shot in, uh, we, sh uh, we shot north of Toronto a little bit, and then we went to BC. Uh -huh. And my wife and I took the train across the country. We had a, about a week break before the crew made it out west, so we took the train across the country and then started shooting in the interior of BC. And that, that big, the A-frame where, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, where the autos lived, they made a deal with the people uh, that owned that place to shoot there. And then they got there. And the people went, oh, no, you can't, you can't come inside. <laughs> no, it's like a hallowed space, man. And, uh, you can't, no, no, you can't go in. And, uh, so they had to build that little, that little box on the outside of the house and then build an interior. Oh, wow. Because, and it was so strange that the autos were playing those such spiritual people you know, this, I just found it was really ironic that, that the house that those spiritual people were going to represent could not be used. <laughs> now, Russell Banks grew up in uh, rural New Hampshire and, and very much, you know, in his early work was, was dealing with his sort of experience of community and family and his own family. Um, did anybody feel there were any resonances that you could uh, associate with sort of life in the North Country and Northern New England at all? Uh, and it, yes? Uh, very, very much so. I was over in the Adirondacks earlier today, in that same area that I think Russell Banks had in mind when he created that story. Yeah. It's Keene, over in right. the <coughs> valley in the Adirondacks. And we, we, we drove over, my wife and I drove over mm -hmm. Spruce Hill, which I, at mm -hmm. least I see that Russell Banks envisions where that bus went off. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it really kind of captures the feeling of that that area and that small town, yeah. the motel and the Elm Tree Inn, which mm -hmm. had been there for many years. And so it's, yeah, we've got that sense, certainly. Yeah, and the, uh, I mean, the, the, the Wen it's Wendell was the name of the guy who owns the hotel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that whole opening monologue where he sort of basically trashes everybody in town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and eats the cheeses. Painfully, you know reminiscent of some of the situation. I mean, I live in the Northeast Kingdom, maybe it's more like that. But uh, in any case, uh, there are other things that I can talk to and want to talk to Bruce about. We're also going to talk in the morning after we watch Wildlife, a recent independent film that Bruce did. Um, but if people have questions right now, I'm happy to open that up or else I can just keep it sort of going. But uh, any, any questions people have? Yes. 
So the film jumps around in time periods back and forth. Yeah. What about the filming? Was it? No, the filming is a, is a function of what's efficient. So, you know, we shoot as, you know, everything in one location and then, and then Adam, Adam is, is well known for, for moving time around and playing with time. So, in terms of the logic of shooting, we just, uh, we shot like you shoot virtually any other movie, which is completely out of order and indiscriminate and entirely location based. Did people like Does those that time your shifts? Question? Yeah. Did people like those time shifts? The way it worked? Yeah. yeah. Um, it worked. I mean, one of the things I think it's good about, about it is that it reveals the idea of the school bus accident uh, sort of without f pushing on the tragedy right away. In other words, the lawyer is the one who reveals it, and it's done through character and through character development and relationship development, and then the way it is then shown is not sensational. It is tragic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But... It, 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 is, uh, it, it makes the movie not about that. It, it, it does not play the, that sensation of that. It, it, it allows that process, those transactional relationships. We don't get terribly involved with the kids even. No, but it's a blade that's hung there early. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and, and it takes 40 minutes for the blade to drop. Yeah. And, but you feel it shudder 15 times yeah. before it finally does. So in, in a sense, he's preparing you, but you're, I mean, you're, you can never really be prepared for something that horrific. And I remember him telling me um, when they, the only thing that's CGI in the movie is the, is the bus. And, uh, and they made a decision that when the, when the bus hit the ice, they spent the money to have it drop once and then realized that, I mean, I think it maybe dropped all the way through and then they realized the thing that would really be horrifying is if it went click, Bang, you know. Um, yeah, but I think it's visually. Yeah, I mean, and the fact that there's, you know, it's done from a wide shot. I think is good, as opposed to being sure. on the bus. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, yeah, well, it's completely uh, inaccessible. Yeah. Nothing you can do. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it keeps it, you know, in a, on, at a, on a perspective that allows the story to play without really, you know. Work messing with you to a certain extent. It allows you because there's plenty of imagination that goes into seeing, you know, that moment, and you basically see it from Billy's point of view. And you know, he gets down there, he just, you know, just it's so fast that there's nothing. How did yeah. they? How did they shoot that moment? Well, we just shot the uh, the bus driving, and then I I don't think the bus even going off the off the off the highway was. Real. That bit might have been. I know the bus sliding on the ice was a CGI thing, but um, CGI is a, is a uh, uh, computer, computer process uh, to generate special effects. So in today's technology, you can create a, a, anything practically happening that does not happen to make it look realistic. Like those um, the shots, the, the the helicopter shots. Well, now it's nothing. You know, even a, a student film can have a drone. Right. But. You know, back in those days, it was a helicopter in the mountains. <laughs> so it was kind of a, it was a kind of a big deal, you know, to get that big overhead shot with the clouds and yeah. And you know, it's relatively inexpensive compared to what it would have been in the old days too. I mean, you know, it's uh, to get a drone shot now. Oh uh, no, drone not a drone shot, but a, but a CGI shot. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they spent some large portion of the budget on the, those ten seconds. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes. What was the idea behind the car wash scene in the beginning, in the night, and in a cold place like that? I, it's really disorienting. Um, I don't know. There was all kinds. There's all kinds of metaphors he could use. That he was he was drowning, but he it, it, nothing could kill him. But he spent his life drowning. Um, that's kind of what it meant to me. Um, and you know, he goes in, has this has this struggle with his daughter, and he comes out into the light, but nothing has changed. Um, it, for me, it was, a, it was a metaphor for the inevitability of tragedy. But um, in terms of Adam's specific desire to use that, uh, that environment, I'm really not sure. Was that car wash Billy's car wash? When he came out and he's walking through uh, what looks like a garage, and then he sees a guitar, and, but he never finds a person. Was that supposed to be? No, I don't think so. I, I think that 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 is a weird cut. 
the guitar. Yeah. Um, and I wondered about it myself this time. I went, that's, God, I don't, I'm not sure how that ties in, because Billy does play guitar, yeah. and I don't know if it was that guitar that I was playing mm -hmm. or not, but, because uh, I, because I think the one that I was playing was a Les Paul, and I don't remember what the thing with it was that was feeding back. Is the uh, place where the school bus is, is stored Billy's Garage? Yeah, it appears to be. Then, then, this, the, cause the car, there's a car wash there. Yeah. Yeah. Which I noticed tonight for the first time. Yes. Oh, it does it? Okay. Well, I, I never, I never made that connection. Yeah. And Billy was also afraid he was going to be charged with negligence in his repairing of the bus. Which, if he can't keep a car wash going, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I never got the sense that he was, he had any type of confidence in his abilities as a mechanic, so yeah. I, I don't think... Let's watch it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah but turn yeah. up the heat. So you can watch yeah. it and report back. Uh, okay, uh, anybody else questions? Yes, again. It was wonderful to hear how you began your involvement with the film, and I'm just curious, you know, when that question was just asked about the car wash scene, and you know, I just keep thinking about what you were saying about the shots lingering on faces, and I'm curious about, do you know anything about Ian Holmes? Um, involved, like, is, was Adam thinking of Ian when he said, I've got to make this Russell Banks film? Did, I mean, because I've never seen Ian in, in anything where I've been not blown away. And, and it, again, tonight, I was like... I, I, that's a good question, but I don't know the answer. Okay. I don't know if, uh, if, if Adam had, had spoken so with Ian beforehand or... This. And then anything, but yeah. I love him. Yeah. 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 Sure. Did Billy help the rest of the children on the bus? Is that clear? No, there's nothing to be done. He didn't. The idea is that they're so far away that it's it's over. And even the choice to to have him at a remove when the bodies are there was a was a was a hard choice for me to 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 go with, you know, because you just think you'd throw yourselves on you throw yourself on the bodies of your children and and why was he so opposed to pursuing this case? Pardon me? Why did he so oppose pursuing this case with the lawyer? I understand why he'd be so opposed to it. Because it wasn't, it's not about, money is not going to change anything. Money, assigning blame to an act of God is a futile pursuit that has no place in a, in a community. Well, I mean, moving on is, is, is not going to be helped by anything in your bank account, right? And if, so Billy was unwilling to to do to assign blame. Yeah, and that there's something fraudulent about it. Um, and I don't even I can't even really tell exactly what his case was going to be. Um, that it was what the guardrail or the town was negligent um, because he talked about it early on, but it never really came to a point where you knew what his strategy specifically was. I mean, the fact yeah. that. That Nicole basically said, "Well, it was Dolores." Made it clear that no other argument was going to prevail. But no, he identifies in the movie early on it's going to be a missing bolt or a, yeah. or a decision by a large company in the building of the bus, or it's going to be a guardrail. But they don't. Yeah. The sense I got was that he did not have any idea how he was going to do it, but he was being he was dri driven to finding blame because of the relations he had with his daughter. Yeah. Was you know he had done everything right and, and everything. So well, that's, yeah, that speaks to the futility of of, uh, of rage in a way, right? And his yeah, and his inability to you know to be to be uh, despite all of his confidence, despite all of his training, he's as vulnerable as anybody else in the situation to a certain extent. I mean, well, yeah, that, that whole image of him crawling toward the autos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you know where you get a laugh, but at the same time it's kind of horrifying. Right. That you see this, in a sense, a predator advancing, but the predator is crawling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the metaphor there is uh, there's there's a handful of metaphors you could use for that. And the and the Pied Piper metaphor as well. I mean, which works on a couple of different levels. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, I think actually, probably what he was looking for by simply mm -hmm. having these depositions and showing that there was no f fault by Dolores for one that the town would get to a point where they would make an out-of-court settlement. I mean, I think that, 
I think the, de the lawyer for the other side there was representing the town. So it was not a legal proceeding per se. They were not getting, it was not a judge that was hearing this. It was just sort of deposing people and seeing where it would lead, I guess. I don't know. I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't know that because the, they, they say that the we got money from, from Dolores's. Dolores' insurance. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure who that lawyer against Ian Holm was, whether he was who he was representing. Is he in the town or the bus company? Probably. I was yeah. imagining it was the bus company. Yeah. yeah. I keep thinking it was the father who did something to the bus yeah. because he impregnated the daughter. And that somehow that was. Oh, wow. Well, that's a whole other Okay. Good. You know. In the back. Yes. Do you know uh, what happened to your character's wife? The mother of the two kids. Cancer. 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 Oh. Yeah. yeah. But the kids were very, very young because she died several years ago and those kids were like, you know, six. The, the uh, young woman who plays uh, Ian Holmes' daughter in the phone booth is Russell Pank Banks' daughter. Wow. Oh. 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 She was bad. Yeah. And he appeared as a doctor. That's right, very briefly. Yeah. Russell Banks also yeah. appears as a doctor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, other questions, other comments? Let me just ask, before we go on, I mean, just looking a little bit of, of the rest of your work, um, talk about the prep how, how, you, how the JFK project came to you and what preparation you did and, you know, maybe just any highlights of that experience. It was... Um, um, Roger, you know, I heard they were doing this movie on uh, uh, that um, Costner was. Have you guys seen 13 Days? Have yeah, you seen yeah. um, About the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in the White House. I heard they were doing it and, and decided to audition, threw my hat in the ring, and uh, listened to a lot of tape and then flew to New York and where they were doing the auditions and, um, and walked into the room. And I was so, I, I was quite, uh, for some reason I was, I was, um, content with being insecure about what I was doing. And um, so I walked into the room with headphones on and uh, from a little Walkman where I had a tape of JFK and, and, um, and said to, started doing it and I said to Roger, oh, just hang on a second. Hang on a second. So I wasn't pretending that I had it in my pocket, you know. Uh, so, was, you know, did an audition and, and, and uh, that was that. You know, pretty, pretty simple. You know? And he called and said, you got it. Yeah, and then he said, we got to find uh, Bobby. And if we can't find a Bobby, we're not doing the movie. So, they looked and looked for Bobby and then found Stephen Culp. And, and, um, and fortunately... Well, I think he does a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and David Self, who wrote the script, had virtually written an actor-proof script. And... Uh, which is not always the case, and, and um, so we all just dove in, and Roger Deakins was originally the DP, and then he and Roger didn't really get along, and, and uh, Donaldson didn't get along, and then uh, Andre Bartoviak, Bartoviak came in and uh, finished, when about a week in, and then, because, he, because Roger Donaldson really liked to move the camera around a lot, and Deakins was, um, he, he and Deakins just didn't see it the same way, so about a week in, they, uh, they switched horses. Did you do a lot of research in the Cuban Missile Crisis? So I read, and I have a live at JFK library now that rivals the Library of Congress. <laughs> yeah, I read and read and read, and then put up the, his his vocal waveforms on my computer, and and you know played with that a long time, and realized that his voice, his oratorical voice, was a you know half an octave higher than his speaking voice. And there was one speech, the Pulaski Day speech, that, that we shot. And I thought, well, that's where I can do the voice that's high, that everybody recognizes, so they know that I know the difference. And I'll do the rest of the movie down in his conversational timber. But, so we shot that, and then it didn't go in the movie. And maybe you're like, well, I don't know. Everybody thinks I thought he had a line. But uh, yeah, we, no, we, we, uh, we did a lot of rehearsal and a lot of, a lot of private rehearsal. Can we still do it? It's not a party favor. <laughs> <laughs> if I try, I'm sure it would be terrible. And, uh, <laughs> what, um, 
What did you learn about Kennedy that was new to you and, uh, you know, in some way illuminating about Kennedy in, in ways that... In a performance sense, I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with, uh, with, the, with the profundity of his physical pain. And, uh, and that was a real, that was something that I could really tap into to uh, absorb the physicality without, <coughs> without a feeling The physicality false. is very distinctive, yeah, that you yeah. got to it. Yeah. Uh, how about just in terms of that event and the, and the struggle that he had to get through it and, and prevail? Well, the, the struggle that he had is, is, has been a, a struggle that many, many presidents have faced in which the, the military who feel they have all the inside information will tell you that you don't fully understand what's at stake and how and, and the kind of strength with which you have, we have to push back in order to make this go away. And he had this, this innate sense mm -hmm. that Khrushchev was mm -hmm. on some level a man of reason and was going to be being pushed around by the same type of generals and military mindset that existed, that was prevailing in the White House at the time. So uh, that his, that, and, and Bobby's sense also, mm -hmm. um, and also choosing to ignore the second letter and read between the lines on the first letter was a was a a, a great big deal that um, mm -hmm. that people with uh, that other other mother men might have not been willing to take a chance on. Yeah, uh, Kennedy had read recently the guns of the August. guns of August. The that influenced him a lot. Yeah, well, because as he says in the movie, the um, the generals in the past war were making decisions based on not on the war they were fighting now. They were making decisions based on the history of wars before them and war changes. So they were making um, decisions that were basically uh, uh, anachronistic or, or, you know, 20 years too late. They just didn't apply. And the Barbara Tuckman book is, uh, is a perfect example of that, what happened the first time. <coughs> yeah. And Curtis LeMay, the Secretary of the Air Force, was sort of nuts. Yeah, great cigar chomping, uh, warmongering nut bar that uh, he he wanted to drop a nuclear bomb after the negotiation. Well, that was, was that the, the Doctor Strangelove. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Strangelove was yeah. a Doctor Strangelove is modeled after Curtis LeMay, the Secretary of the Air Force uh, under JFK, who then became uh, George Wallace's vice presidential candidate in 1968. Could have gone bad much earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, pretty amazing. Um, but uh, and then you played Robert McNamara also, Secretary yeah, just of Defense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to try and play everybody in the Kennedy cabinet. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, anybody? Any other questions? Do you also do theater? Yep. Yep. What's the next? The, project? I don't know. The next thing is the last thing. We, I did a tour of. Uh, of a play written by Steve, a musical written by Stephen King, with the, and the music was done by uh, by um, uh, John Mellencamp, and we toured that. Yeah, we toured that through the Midwest too. Uh, with, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. What's the name? It's called the Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. It was this. We we workshopped it in New York, and then we toured it through the Midwest for a month, and then they they toured it again the following year, but. Um, yeah, it didn't. It's, yeah. It didn't make it further than that. Yeah. What was your experience like uh, in St. Elsewhere? Well, I mean, the, the very idea that you can get by playing a doctor with a mullet, I think, is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it, I guess when I I'm doing a, I'm doing a television series right now where I'm playing a doctor, and a, a handful of my friends called me and said, "Wow, the beginning and the end of a career, doctor." <laughs> Um, well, it was interesting because uh, St. Elsewhere at the time was sort of groundbreaking and, uh, you know, they were, did all this elliptical storytelling and pulling the curtain back on what really happens, that kind of thing. And, uh, and they had some great techniques, some physical techniques. For example, a lot of the dolly shots you'd see in the hallways, they were not dollies. There, were, there would just be a cameraman on a, on a fernie pad. And he'd be like this, and the crew would be dragging him on a furry bed. And so we'd get that kind of cinema verite thing. And they'd you know, swing him around a corner. And, um, that was, that was, uh, those are, those are good times. 
And then you did a few episodes of Mad Men also. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that was actually a fairly elaborate production. It was production design, a lot of production design, shot it in 35 millimeter film, I believe. Uh, at least I was told that Mad, Mad Men shot on film. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's correct, but yeah. I, um, you'd think I'd remember it was only a few years ago. But uh, yeah, that was very, very structured. I mean, I've, I've done lots of stuff that is less structured, but um, Matthew mm -hmm. Weiner is, uh, is, a, is a famously structured guy and asks you to do very specific things. And my, once, uh, after being on the set um, and seeing how specific he is in, in, and the kind of specificity that he requires from his actors to then go back and look at what the other actors have done in the preceding five years or whatever it was, it really, you really go, wow, you guys are um, really amazing. It's very, really, really demanding. Mm -hmm. Not Star Trek. It was just a, uh, just a great deal of fun with a bunch of great people. Yeah. All right, Bruce, thanks a thanks lot. Thanks so much for coming.